Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's Eileen Bird here, uh, director here at Two Life. And I want to say hello. And uh, we still have people joining. As we've all learned with Zoom, sometimes we uh, kind of wait to the last minute to get everybody in and on. But uh, I'm really excited about today's program. And you know, the one thing that I'm going to just uh, add to the, the thought process as we think here today is as I'm driving to work, I'm thinking about the heartbeat and just how calming a heartbeat is and, and that ability to protect our heart health and to, <clears throat> excuse me, and to focus on, uh, on the heart, I think is one of those most fundamental and important elements of the life that we live here today. And so, um, so that kind of leads us off. And, uh, and as people are joining on, uh, I'm just going to start a couple things here today and say, I am so excited that we are uh, running the program that we are today. And we've invited back uh, Dr. Heather Stahura, who has been a, um, a, a cardiologist practicing in our area. And you'll hear more about, about Dr. Stahura. But we, we certainly are seeing that of uh, this, this linkage between uh, our oncology treatment and the protection of our, of our heart is, uh, is a growing uh, area of study and field. And, uh, and Dr. Stahura is nothing short of, I think, a pioneer in being sure that we are uh, as protected as possible. Okay, so a couple things that I want to uh, just kind of get us started off here. Uh, we have a, a lot of people that had registered. We actually had quite a few people registering in the last couple of days. And I guess that's kind of how life is now as we think through things. And I'm so glad you're here. We will be recording the program and making it available uh, on our YouTube page. It probably might take a day or two just for editing and so forth. And so you can take a look for that. Uh, but we will welcome questions. Dr. Stahora will speak for 40 minutes or so. She's got uh, some prepared material, quite a bit of wonderful prepared material as I've gotten a, a, a preview. And then we will welcome questions uh, for Dr. Stahora and, and go through that. And, um, and so what I'd like to do now is invite uh, Mayor Ginsburg, uh, the president and, or, excuse me, former president and founder yes, yes. of Two Life. I know it, my Freudian slip. Uh, of Two Life and um, and very active in the survivor community. So, Mira, welcome. so um, thank you, Eileen. And um, I just want to tee up the importance of this topic by saying, in 1996, when I was personally first diagnosed at the age of 36, the last thing I was worried about was my heart. I was worried about surviving cancer. But nevertheless, because I was about to have a course of treatment that included a drug called adriamycin, um, I was instructed to get a MUGA scan. And I had it, and I had my treatment and my surgery, and then I did not see a cardiologist for literally decades. So that was, it was good that they checked, and maybe they checked a new MUGA after my treatment. It's been so long, but that was it. So, so much has changed in terms of what we know about survivorship. Um, and that's one of the reasons this is such an important topic. And um, I mean, stole my word and we didn't have this conversation. But we all <laughs> think alike. I was going to say we have a pioneer in this field of this subspecialty of cardio-oncology right here in the capital region. So I feel really fortunate and lucky on behalf of people living in this region that we have somebody who's so attuned to um to helping helping we the patients uh stay healthy so with that eileen give the formal introduction thank you okay here we go all right so um that's so interesting mary that you were talking about pioneers so um anyway so dr stahora uh, is a oncologist with capital cardiology associates here in albany uh, she was born and raised in Amsterdam, and so it's so wonderful that you are uh, literally a hometown uh, person, and attended Amsterdam High School. She graduated summa cum laude, for those keeping score, and that was not a small accomplishment, from the University of Albany with a major in biology and a dual minor in chemistry and physics, and so not much, not studying time there. Uh, she attended Stony Brook School of Medicine 
While at Stony Brook Medical School, she was a recipient of the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Um, then she, accomplished, she completed internal medicine residency at Northwell Health, uh, form, formerly known as North Shore Long Island Jewish Hospital System. After her postgraduate training downstate, she returned home to the Capital District to train further in cardiovascular disease at Albany Medical Center. Dr. Stahura joined Capital Cardiology in the summer of 2018. Uh, she has a passion for preventative cardiology, women's heart health, valvular, if I say that right, you might have to correct me there, heart disease, congestive heart failure, and coronary art artery disease. Her commitment to patient heart health led to the development of the cardio-oncology division at Capital Cardiology Associates, cardio-oncology being a growing subspecialty of medicine, as we just said. Welcome, Dr. Stahora. We're so happy you're here. Thank you, ladies. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you, everyone, for signing on today. This is, this is a great turnout so far. Should I try to share my slides right now, everybody? Yes, that would be okay. wonderful. Let me see if I can do that. Sorry, bear with me. All right. Is that visible for everyone to see? I can see it. Perfect. Okay. So let's start off with just as what is cardio oncology? Because lots of times too, even on my business card, when I hand it out, people are like, what is this? Are you an oncologist? Are you a cardiologist? First and foremost, I am a cardiologist through and through. I just have a special obsession with my oncology patients and treating heart-related uh, um, issues that can happen with them. So let me move this, I apologize. Let me move this out of the way. <clears throat> so we aim to improve the health of patients with cancer and survivors through education, screening, treatment when necessary, and further research and collaborating with our oncology and radiation oncology um, uh, uh, partners. Our goal, and I love this statement, is to ensue that the cancer patient of today does not become the heart patient of tomorrow. Okay. And the reason why this is so important are, if you look at this slide, back in the 1960s, the survival rate was, was not great. Through advancements through research, new medications, early implementation of screening mammograms, we now have a greater than 90% survival rate <clears throat> for our breast cancer patients. And, but so that leads to the scope of the problem. As women and men are living longer with this disease, they can in com come in contact with more trouble, which can be from the heart later on. So breast cancer and cardiovascular disease are significant causes of morbidity and mortality in the United States. What those words mean, mean, especially if you're ever looking at any medical studies, morbidity means living with the disease and mortality means passing away from the disease. So if you look at the breakdown here too, cardiac disease affects approximately 48 million women in America, while breast cancer impacts 3.3 million. I mean, these are staggering numbers, but as you can see, now that women are living longer post, post their diagnosis into that, those years and years of survivorship, the thing that can affect them most is actually cardiovascular disease. And if you go to the bottom part down there in older or postmenopausal women, they looked at women seven years, really seven to 10 years after their cancer diagnosis, <clears throat> their mortality risk due to cardiac disease is higher in those people with breast cancer than those women without a history of breast cancer. So this is where that research is still ongoing is what is the connection between cancer and heart related disease? Some of what we'll talk about today has to do with the treatments that go on, but there is a direct link with cancer and heart related issues like congestive heart failure and coronary disease years later on. And I think that opens up a lot more for research to be done. This slide over on the side here, if you look at the breakdown with, um, um, with all of these kind of bar graphs here, CHD stands for coronary heart disease, stroke, lung cancer, and breast cancer. And it breaks it down actually by white women, black women, and Hispanic women. And as you can see, this, the, the biggest risk comes with the coronary heart disease. There's still, these are nothing to, to snuff at, but staggering changes that way. And this slide I'm very proud about, I was just chatting with the ladies before we started is, what does, does what we do matter? Does it help our patients some? There is always a baseline risk with any 
treatment of anything, cardiac disease, lung trouble, kidney, anything, including breast cancer. What I love to see here is that with our treatment of early detection and surveillance and then implementing therapies when necessary, the risk of this dotted line up on the top goes down. And then you can even look at how much for, forward into the future when you're in your survivorship program, um, five, 10, 15, even 20 years after your diagnosis, we are able to really shift this curve in the right direction lower with implementing strategies like treatment and just screening. <clears throat> so let's go first to a case presentation. Okay. Ooh. Oops, I'm sorry. Let me back it up a second. Technical difficulties here. 60 year old female LS presents 10 months after her diagnosis with breast cancer. She's had a lumpectomy followed by chemotherapy with a regimen that included adriamycin, cytoxin, and taxol, pretty common regimen. She comes in presenting with fatigue, shortness of breath, and leg swelling. So first, let me see if I can pause this. Let me orient everyone first. This is called an echocardiogram, which is a common test ultrasound of the heart. You do ultrasounds of babies, kidneys, liver. This is predominant. This was the one, my bread and butter of the heart. So up top in the beginning of the screen, you can see kind of blacks and white. Black is how blood shows up inside the heart. So ultrasound is sound waves that come through, bounce off of structures in the body and receive back at the probe that is put on your body. So white is actually your heart tissue. And I want everyone, if they can, to focus on really this area right here called the left ventricle. Um, what I want you to watch is how it's squeezing and see if you can spot what I'm trying to have everybody get at. These things right here that are opening and closing are your heart valves that let the blood in and out like doors. But I'm gonna play this image twice so we can appreciate. And again, please look at this area right here. Let's play that one more time. So I hope everyone can appreciate that although you see those valves opening and closing, you don't see much movement of that ventricle, which is the heart pump. Um, this is something that's quite concerning. It's consistent with a term called congestive heart failure, where your heart has no forward flow out. And we assess this with something called an ejection fraction, your EF. The ejection fraction is the amount of blood that's squeezed out with each heartbeat. And what this is showing is that the ejection fraction is significantly low. I, I'd quote this with being around 10% or so. Let's look at this in another view. This is called a four chamber view of which you put the probe over kind of on your side over here. And what you're looking at is all four chambers of the heart. This is the left ventricle, which we just talked about over in that other view, the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, right atrium, this makes it the mitral valve and the left atrium. So again, I want you to focus on this kind of structure right here. And I'm sorry for the ambient sounds. This was a recording, so people were talking in the background. <clears throat> and again, I'm just gonna play that one more time. And again, what I think you can appreciate here is how there is not very significant movement of this heart function, and it's kind of global. It's not just one wall that's affected and not the other. It's basically the whole heart itself. Now, unfortunately, with LS, this had been going on for a little bit of time, and she this white part down at the tip here is actually a blood clot that formed. So in a heart where the blood flow is not moving quickly, just like a pond, if the, if the, if the fluid or the water isn't moving or uh, briskly, you can have sediment form. And that's what happens in the heart. That tip there is actually um, coagulated blood that is sticking there because there wasn't very good movement. So part of her treatment included medications that are known to help the heart function. Typical ones that were, are implemented are called either ACE inhibitors, something called lisinopril, or ARB, angioretensin blockers called Losartan, Valsartan, you can get the, they all kind of sound alike. And then usually beta blockers consistent with carvedilol, metoprolol, or bisoprolol. 
She also got diuretics to help her um, remove some of the fluid that was congested in her legs and in her lungs from the congestive heart failure. She got anticoagulation, which is a blood thinner to help with that blood clot in the tip of her heart. And she received very close follow-up with cardiology. After three months of medical therapy, as well as physical therapy, which is always, you're gonna hear me harp on this, is that exercise is so important to keep up with this for heart strengthening and heart for protection. Her repeat echocardiogram showed a normalization of her ejection fraction. Remember that was the squeezing potential of her heart that we did not appreciate in those first two images. And just for references, a normal ejection fraction is 55% or greater. Low normal is if it goes to 50 to 55, and anything above 55% is all gravy, we love it. So what if we could predict? What if we could look at patients and see who could possibly be affected the way that LS was? Busy slide, but what I just wanna bring into um, speaking about is something called strain imaging. So some of the, pa uh, the people attendees today may have been my patients and you'll hear me talk about what's your ejection fraction and what's your strain. Strain is something that we look at if you, um, where it's more of like the shortening of the heart, more like an accordion. So instead of squeezing towards the middle, we're looking how it shortens this way. And what we found through medical studies is that if your strain, your shortening kind of from a north to south perspective was starting to go down, then you can predict that maybe this might be affecting your ejection fraction in the near future. So we it cues us into those patients. A normal strain is around um, negative 18. And if we start with your screening echo starting to see it go down, we may want to implement heart medications like how LS got to try to protect the heart function or watch you more closely to make sure that your treatment is not affecting you in the wrong way. <clears throat> Apologize, let me just move some of this out of the way. Okay, so this is kind of a... Sorry guys, this is a risk score that we use up top. And basically there are some medicines that are more important to, to look at that can cause heart toxicity or troubles with the heart. And as you see up top with that first box up there, the high risk, anthracyclines, cyclophosphamide, Herceptin use. Pertuzumab, I would say it's in the intermediate risk, but I even sometimes bring it up to the high risk category. And even uh, in the lower risk, the desantinib, rare for rituximab or some of these medicines to cause it. So definitely pertaining to the breast cancer patients, you're looking at the anthracyclines, the um, adriamycin, the herceptin, the pertuzumab that are the, the most concerning ones. And then we assess each patient in the cardio-oncology clinic. Have you had a history of cardiomyopathy or congestive heart failure? Have you ever had coronary disease? Now remember peripheral arterial disease or lower extremity blockages uh, a cholesterol deposition in your legs needing vascular surgery, that's technically an ang or a coronary disease equivalent. So we treat you just as aggressively for that. If you have high blood pressure or diabetes, um, if you've had anthracyclines before, uh, some of the patients that I take care of, they may have survived a childhood cancer like um, uh, lymphoma or leukemia and been exposed to anthracyclines. Now they have breast cancer in their 40s or 50s, and it's their second time receiving this medication. That matters too. If you've had a uh, prior or uh, concurrent chest radiation, most specifically, which we'll get into if you have left-sided um, radiation to your chest, because that's where your heart lies. If you were very young, less than 15 receiving your treatment or eight or greater 65 than years old. And unfortunately being female gender confers some more cardiac risk. And what those monitoring recommendations below on this slide show you is that with each patient, we assess how risky it is for them to be on these meds. And we may screen you more frequently. Um, back in the day, you used MUGA scans. We try not to use MUGAs unless absolutely necessary because they give you a little bit of radiation. An ultrasound or echocardiogram gives you absolutely no radiation. It's a neutral test. So this way you can screen appropriately and frequently without exposing the person to excess risk from radiation. Um, we usually do these in the beginning of your treatment as well as every three months while you're on your treatment. And sometimes usually three to six months after your treatment or up to a year, depending on what we assess your risk to be. And at the bottom here, you'll see the management recommendations. If we think that you're at high risk, given you have some of those pred predominant risk factors before, you've had cardiomyopathy, hypertension, diabetes, um, 
radiation to your chest, we may want to institute those ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or beta blockers up front. If we start to see your strain imaging going down or your EF decline a little bit, we may want to put those on sooner. And we kind of use medications depending on how you fit into these models here. So what about the future? You guys probably saw some of these commercials on TV for Entresto. Cardiologists, we love Entresto, but it's we know it has excellent data for patients who have reduced heart function or depressed ejection fractions and, and congestive heart failure, but it hasn't been that well studied in the cancer population. Um, um, trials are ongoing right now and they're quite positive. So a lot of us are implementing um, this medication early. If you're not really responding to your ACE inhibitor or ARB, we will try to get you on to Entresto um, because it's working so well for other patients with cardiomyopathies that we take care of. And this was just a paper here of the use of uh, valsartan secubitril, which is AKA Entresto therapy as treatment for trastuzumab induced cardiomyopathies. So who do we want to see in the clinic? Who do I want to come and either talk to their oncologists who are wonderful, they can give you guidance, talk to your people at Two Life, or just come and see us. Those who've been exposed to adriamycin, aka doxorubicin, if you are getting or exposed to trastuzumab herceptin, pertuzumab progetta, or in HER2 therapy. If you've received or, received or going to receive left-sided breast or whole chest radiation, if you're on hormonal therapy with tamoxifen, arimidex, or anastrozole, predominantly because these can increase your rates of hypertension, high, or high blood pressure, it also affects your cholesterol. Anything hormonal, um, whether it's medications or going through menopause, will affect your cholesterol levels. And if this is something you're being treated for in your 30s, we don't want you going 10, 15, 20 years with high cholesterol without appropriate treatment because that could lead to coronary disease in the future. And if you're on anything like immune checkpoint inhibitors, something called Keytruda, uh, this is also rare, but it can affect your heart muscle. And so I like to watch my patients and keep tabs on them closely. Stalking, as I call it, if you're in my clinic. Um, breast cancer itself can cause some changes to the heart. We're talking about the treatment, but just the disease itself. Um, sometimes what patients can come in with is they may say they have shortness of breath or any other issues that way, swelling, and we do an echo. And what we find is that their heart muscle is strong, but they actually have an accumulation of fluid around their heart. So in that diagram to the right hand side there, there's your heart and there's a thin membrane that lives over the top of it, something called the pericardium. Fluid can accumulate in there and it's normally driven by the breast cancer process itself. And as you see on the left hand side with our ultrasound, remember blood or fluid comes up black. So you can see an accumulation of fluid around the heart kind of squeezing and encompassing on it. Many times this does need to be drained to let the heart do its job more effectively. And normally when your oncologist regressively treats the breast cancer, uh, the effusion, the fluid will go down. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna talk about radiation to the chest or the breast tissue. So um, quick diagram here. This is actually like you're looking at a person but their feet are pointing towards you. So the right side of the body is actually where the, the beams are coming in and the left side is the one that's free from the radiation beams. And I just like this diagram because you can see that it really does matter where the radiation is coming into the chest. This is an excellent point in saying that they're targeting the breast tissue here without with missing most of the important body organs inside, including your lung tissue. And most importantly for me, the heart muscle. So there are some ways to help to decrease the risk of radiation injury to the heart. One that is done is called the deep breath hold method. And on the left-hand side, you can see if you were to just take the, take the radiation in that box around there, that the tip of the heart is actually being exposed to that radiation beam, which we'll talk about does have some concern to the heart muscle. Just simply by taking a deep breath in, you'll notice even if you do it to yourself, your chest wall rises, thereby pulling your breast tissue away from the heart muscle. And, um, and that way you're actually missing the heart when the radiation oncologist team is, is giving the radiation to the breast and you're effectively um, helping the organs not to be affected by that radiation beam, but still getting after the cancer appropriately. 
Um, another way that you can protect your inner organs is something called prone breast radiation. Um, if it's kind of hard to see on this slide, but do you see in the middle picture there, there's a red line around the breast tissue and there's a tumor inside more on the yellow side there. Just by putting your belly down and hanging the breast tissue down, it pulls the breast tissue away from the inner organs like the heart and the blackness that's inside of the CT scan there, thereby missing the heart. To the right hand side, you can see if you did not do this method, that tip of the heart would be affected again by getting hit by the radiation. Um, this has uh, been able to spare cardiac and lung tissue, less exposure to the chest, especially in large breasted women of, of which in a uh, radiation oncologist may have to give more radiation to. And this is more advantageous, the larger that a woman's breast tissue is. <clears throat> So what can radiation do over the long term to the heart? Most of this type of activity, we spoke before about how some of the chemotherapies and some of the other immune therapies that are given can affect the heart kind of on a quicker basis while you're getting your treatment and soon thereafter. Radiation heart disease is something that affects the heart 5, 10, 15 plus years after you've received it. And what you can see is that it affects the heart valves. So the valves, remember the doors that open and close in the heart, let the blood flow in and out. A healthy aortic valve, it looks like a Mercedes Benz sign. And it should be almost like tissue paper, like with how flimsy it is that can open and close. When the valve gets affected by radiation, um, it makes it hard and chunky and difficult to open well, something called stenosis. What happens too is when it's so chunky and, and thick, it doesn't close well and it can cause regurgitation or leakiness. So if you have a diseased valve, it tends to be very tight, not open, and also very leaky, which causes uh, backflow of the blood and can precipitate things like heart failure, swelling, and all those issues. That's how it looks on that right side there where it's all thickened. On the echocardiogram, because we're talking a lot about this, that's how the pictures look. When I when I look at the heart, I can see. Remember where those arrows are pointing? You see how much thicker that looks. Um, it almost it's 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 white. It's and it's just probably twice the size that it should be. This is how I know that the radiation has affected the valve, and we watch it move. Radiation can also affect your pericardium, which remember is that sac that sits around the heart. Here's an anatomical picture on the left of kind of like thickened fibrinous deposition on there, and it gets hard, just like calcium in your bones. On a CAT scan, we can we can appreciate this, how there's that almost looks like a cone right around the tip of the heart there. And remember on those pictures I showed you, if the radiation is hitting right there, that's when it can hit the tip of it and cause some thickening there. And again, these are all things that we screen for once we assess all of everything you've been through in your oncology clinic, we look at all of these different things in my office. What does radiation do to our heart arteries? It causes something called oxidative stress. It activates this uh, cascade of different things that cause inflammation and cytokine release. And we all know that inflammation, whether it's due to cancer, diabetes, and now heart disease is public enemy number one to our hearts. The more inflammation in our heart arteries, the more that it causes these things called foam cell formation, which allows cholesterol to deposit underneath your arteries and start getting bigger. And I think there's a misnomer that we think that cholesterol sits kind of just on the top of the artery. It actually gets underneath the lining and then starts to grow, almost like getting underneath a pillowcase and, and forming. So it's kind of underneath your own artery. And that's why it's just something we can't suck out. Like I get that question a lot. Can't we just suck it out? It's actually underneath the lining, but radiation can cause early coronary disease this way. So something your doctor, whether it's me or somebody else might recommend is maybe we should do a calcium score to see how much cholesterol is actually in your arteries to begin with. It's a, it's a risk score we use. So calcium, think of this differently than the calcium that is in your medicines like Tums or your, your doctor might prescribe for osteoporosis two different things, and I don't want you to stop those treatments. As cholesterol hardens in your heart arteries, it calcifies, and this test as a CAT scan can pick up the amount of that in there. So if you've been in my clinic, you will see, I, I love this next picture, I'm gonna pull that up. Here are four different people, one, two, three, four. The heart is gray, the bone is white. Bone has calcium in it. 
the heart should not. So you see in person number one up in the upper uh, left corner there, the heart is all nice and gray, calcium score is zero. Number two, just going over to the right, there's just a little bit of that crud that's over here in, in, the, um, in, the, in the artery right here called the LAD, gives you a very low score. The more cholesterol that starts to deposit in the heart arteries, the higher your calcium score goes up. And then you look at this person who has a ton of cardiac disease all over. And coronary disease can be asymptomatic. That's why we sometimes do these preventative tests to know, are we in a good realm or do we need to divulge a little bit deeper in here and maybe institute some therapies? So if we break down the scoring, the best score you can get is to be a zero. You've never wanted to be a zero more than, than in this test. That is no identifiable plaque. You have a very low cardiac risk in the future. And it's really less than 5% risk of having any presence of coronary disease. It's a great examination. One to 10 has a small amount of cholesterol or plaque burden, but it makes that you have, that you have underlying coronary disease very unlikely. A score of 100 to 10, has mild disease, likely minimal stenosis. This is where we tend to talk about implementing some therapies, not normally aspirin, but potentially with what your cholesterol numbers are. We would just look at all of that in family history and see if we can benefit from any lipid lowering strategies. If you have a score of 100 to 400, this is in that moderate range group. That means you at least have coronary disease in, in possibly one or other territories and that it confers more risk for you in the future. Any score over 100 is considered extensive and high risk. Normally for most cardiologists, anyone with a score over 100, we will put you through a stress test to make sure that we're really not missing anything and nothing that's provocable that we can see, but we will still treat you with medicines as well. And, at, and definitely institute, institute I'm sorry, um, uh, things like the Mediterranean diet, heart health, healthy eating and getting you on a regular exercise plan. So let's talk about cholesterol next. Normally, if you get a calcium score, if not before, but definitely after, we'll check your cholesterol numbers. The green uh, top up here is the ideal. So 200 or less for your total is important, but really I wanna know what your breakdown is. LDL is your lousy. Think of that for L for lousy cholesterol. Ideally, you want that to be less than 100. HDL, think of that the healthy. L for lousy, H for healthy. It's beneficial to have that score over 60 and to have your triglycerides, which are also like the fat in the bloodstream, you can think of it that way, made by the liver, less than 150. You are borderline if your total cholesterol is anywhere from 200 to 240. If your LDL is creeping up to the 160s, and then if, you, if your HDL starts to go down low, so low HDL has cardiac risk to it. So as women, we 40 to 60, men 50 to 60. And if your triglycerides start approaching greater than 150 to 200, you're in that starting to be danger zone. Uh, definitely your cholesterol is high if it's above 240. Um, if your cholesterol, LDL is very high if it's approaching 190 or higher. If your LDL, excuse me, HDL is lower than 40, definitely in a risk category. And if the triglycerides are above um, 200, we get concerned. Definitely above 500, you're in a, in a, in a danger zone. So the common statins we use in order of strength would be Restuvastatin or Crestor, Atorvastatin or Lipitor, Simvastatin, Pravastatin. And again, that's the strength of them. The statins also have something called pleiotropic effects. So not only do they just reduce your LDL, they tend to harden the cap of the cholesterol. Remember how I said it gets underneath like a pillowcase and that can get flimsy. It hardens the cap so that the cholesterol can't rupture through. And it also has anti-inflammatory benefits as well. That, what I think is the most um, impressive are showing these benefits, especially in cancer patients. So these research studies are currently ongoing, but upfront using uh, statins for people who need whole chest radiation or um, um, just in cancer patients alone, not only just with breast, we're also looking at it for lymphoma and leukemia patients, but those are still ongoing, so to, to be continued. <clears throat> Risk factors for radiation-induced heart disease. If you have, uh, we talked a couple, a couple times about left-sided radiation. If you've had a high cumulative dose, so that's something in cardio-oncology clinic we try to assess is how much radiation in total did you get? If you were young at the time of your radiation, 
if you have uh, the presence or extent of the tumor next to the heart where your radiation oncologist can't shield the heart like they'd like to, say if you have a lung nodule or your, your um, breast nodules right near the heart, if you had inadequate or absent shielding of the heart, if you also have concomitant chem chemotherapy like the anthracyclines um, or um, uh, adriamycin, if you have those underlying cardiovascular risk factors, underlying hypertension, diabetes, smoking history, family history, those we, we, get, we do an assessment for. Or if you already had pre-existing cardiac disease, maybe you've had a stent in the past or have a known calcium score of 200 or so. So this is typically the things that we go through when you come in for a cardio-oncology visit. We first look at your genetics. Does everyone in your family have risks of cardiomyopathy, weakened heart muscle? Do people in your family have early heart disease? Environmental. Sometimes things we know if you were exposed to, let's say you were in the army and you were exposed, exposed to Agent Orange, we know that that can cause some um, early coronary trouble. We then look at what you received. Did you get chemotherapy? What kinds? Did you get radiation? What type of surgery did you have? And then we'll usually assess your health behaviors. Do you smoke? Is your weight at a good level? Do you live a sedentary lifestyle? Could we improve it with exercise and get you on a plan? Do you have something called metabolic syndrome, which is where you have increased abdominal obesity, low healthy cholesterol, and impaired glucose tolerance, either diabetic or pre-diabetic. This confers insulin resistance, which worsens the whole cascade. This slide I like shows um, that because it, Heart disease affects all of us. Predominantly some though still in certain areas, like in the South, you can see the red has a more age adjusted average rates. But if you kind of zoom in on New York, um, where we are, we kind of have that beautiful darker salmon color into that red color where our area is. Um, so this is something prevalent in our community. So why does it matter? Heart disease is the leading cause of death in women in the United States. In 2020, it was 314,000 women or every one in five female deaths. Many times I hear in the office, this is, oh, it's like a man's disease. And that's concerning to me because I, I, I feel like with more education, this will get better. And that's why I'm so thankful to, to groups like Two Life who allow me to talk about this so that women know that this is something that with early intervention and, and surveillance, we can really get after sooner and we don't have to be part of the statistics. Um, and two thirds of women who die suddenly from coronary disease had no previous symptoms. So this notion, well, shouldn't they have felt something before? Unfortunately, not always. That's why I like to do this other background testing, ultrasounds, calcium score, look at your blood pressure, um, look at your A1C, check an EKG and try to screen for all of these things. Traditional risk factors. So things I'll harp on and, and harass my patients about smoking easily the most preventable thing that we can do to help women, especially less than 50 years old. And it's dose dependent. So the more you smoke, the more cardiac risk that this increases. Secondhand smoke also increases the risk. Hypertension. Um, in 2020, 47% of adults over the age of 20 in the United States were defined as hypertensive. That's crazy. That's almost 50% of us. 44% of those were female. So we are, we are neck and neck with the men, ladies. And statistically, we're less controlled than men. Uh, frequently, I hear people say, oh, they're just anxious. It's their anxiety, which we get labeled a lot as women. No, I think we're vastly undertreating it for our, fe for our females. For women with hypertension, it threefold increases your risk of heart disease. However, this decreases if we treat you appropriately. High cholesterol, aka hyperlipidemia. And we, there was a study it looked at from 2015 to 2018, 12% um, of adults greater than 20 years old, had total cholesterols greater than 240, remember in that danger zone. 17% had a low HDL less than 40. 94 million US adults, 20 years and plus, have a, um, a total cholesterol greater than 200, and um, 28 million have a total cholesterol greater than 20, 240. Nearly 7% of children ages six to 19 have hyperlipidemia. Cholesterol levels will increase after menopause. Remember we said, even no matter if it's medication induced, surgical induced or natural menopause, we tend to see cholesterol levels go up and blood pressure increase. Interestingly, with one of the studies that was done is there can be small amounts of athroma regression, which is the, the cholesterol in the arteries. So it can actually get slightly better with women on statins. 
not drastically, I'm not talking going from a 40% blockage to a 15% blockage, but you may be able to get something like a 40 to 10, which in my book is wonderful. Physical inactivity. Unfortunately, sedentary behaviors are more common in women. This can lead to worse rates of diabetes, which confers more cardiac disease in women. There's more stroke, mortality, myocardial infarctions, heart failure, and peripheral vascular disease in this population. Obesity, which is a BMI greater than 40, increases mortality for women. It increased by 64% for women and 46% for men. And something that we touched on before called metabolic syndrome, that's when you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, but really a low HDL, abdominal obesity, and excess blood sugar or insulin resistance. <clears throat> So I, I, I want to talk a little bit about some women's specific risk factors to traditional ones that we've kind of talked about ad nauseum or there on the left-hand side, but also things that when you come into the office, I talk about is, did you have any preterm delivery? Did you have any hypertension disorders in pregnancy, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension? Those confer increased risk in women later on, even if you're not hypertensive after giving birth. Autoimmune diseases lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, again, with that inflammation that we think hurts the heart arteries. We've talked about the breast cancer treatments and depression. Years of depression, anxiety, and psychiatric disease can confer some cardiac risk. Women with hypertensive disorders in pregnancy um, are at an increased risk of cardiac disease, type two diabetes, kidney disease, and eye disease. Menopause. You have an increased risk of, of heart-related trouble after menopause. It's increased if you have early menopause, again, whether that's from medicine-induced, surgically-induced menopause, or if you just naturally went into menopause earlier. Um, but there is slightly more risk if you, it was surgical-induced. The loss of ovarian function decreases your estrogen levels, which are kind of that protective effect when we're younger. Now, heart-related chest pain. Many times women do present with the same typical features of back pain, squeezing sensation, sh shortness of breath, but there are some things that when I see patients in the hospital with heart attacks, it can be a little bit different. Many women present with nausea or vomiting. They think it was their reflux disease. They try some Tums, it didn't go away. Be something I tell my patients, if you try your over-the-counter remedies that normally help acid reflux and it does not work, it could be something heart-related. If you have jaw pain, neck pain, or upper back pain, tends to be more female signs. You can have typical chest pain, but not always. Sometimes it, it does affect more in the upper abdomen. That's why people think it could be gastro related. Shortness of breath, fainting, or extreme fatigue. And normally it's a couple of these things all together. So I, I encourage my patients to know their numbers. What is your blood pressure? Know what is normal for you. Screen your blood pressure at home. Normal is 120 over 80. We are in that mild range if you're in the 120s to 130 systolic, that top number, your diastolic is 80s. But anything above 130 over 80 is considered high blood pressure and we try to aggressively treat your risks that way. So here's my harping on the exercise, right? Moderate exercise improves a stronger heart. It improves your circulation to your lower extremities. It is a natural mood booster for endorphins and it promotes better sleep. It has been shown consistently to lower your blood sugar, keep you, if you're pre-diabetic, exercise helps to keep you in the non-diabetic realm. And it can actually, I have a bunch of patients with weight loss, exercise and bedding eating have been able to get off some of their blood pressure medications, which is always like the best thing to be like, you don't need these meds anymore. Um, it helps to manage your weight and reduce your stress, which is so necessary in this post-pandemic world we live in. So this is my last little tidbit of uh, medical support for exercise. So on the left-hand side of this graph, it's the proportion of patients surviving without cardiovascular events. And then on the bottom here is years since your breast cancer diagnosis. So the purple line on top is more intense exercise. That's called METS, metabolic equivalence of exercise. And then the bottom blue line is kind of weaker exercise, your typical just leisurely walking. And as you can see of years after a woman's diagnosis, the more intense exercise, their heart stayed stronger longer. So those who do exercise during their treatment when they're able to and after, their heart stayed stronger. So cardiac exercise is literally protective. 
and overall the goals of my cardio oncology program. I want to ensure, ensure better outcomes for patients with cancer and cardiac issues. I want to provide earlier detection of toxic side effects, reduce further damage, possibly reverse it, and always, always better understand the cardiac issues in patients with cancer by hopefully participating in research summaries and collaborating with my other partners decreasing cardiac disease as a barrier to effective cancer therapy. I try to tell my patients, my goal is not to get in, in the middle of your cancer treatment. I'm like your little heart stalker that helps you along the way, watching and making sure that we're not affecting other organs while you're going through your treatment. And then once you become a survivor, watching you closely thereafter. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. I'm trying to start my video. It's not working. Um, do I have to Sarah. stop screen sharing? Do you think that's... I no, no, it's just here I am. That was so informative. And um, I typed a few questions into the chat that you may, uh, may be able to see. Um, and I think, mean, did you, you had a question as well. Did you want to kick it off? Well, I, I did. I, I can start with, with questions. And so, uh, Dr. Stahura, what we'll do is uh, now I want to invite everyone, I'm sure that there's a number of questions or thoughts that are going through people's minds. And so I invite you to use either the chat feature and or the Q&A to put questions into. And so I will kick off and then Mara will pick up because I'm gonna be leaving here in just a few minutes time. But actually one of the questions that I did have was uh, for some individuals who may not be actively seeing you, or I guess I'm looking in that realm of what, what what should I know that I don't know today? Are there some of the tests that you are suggesting that could be uh, that could could be done during an annual physical uh, by your internal medicine, you know, specialist and and that kind of thing? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. I think um, now if you're having symptoms like how LS did, shortness of breath, swelling, I, I would ask you to you know come to see us at Capital Cardiology. We have a walk-in clinic call for a new appointment, but let's say you have no symptoms at all and you just wanna be screened. Um, certain things like getting your blood pressure checked, getting your cholesterol checked. And then your primary care, they're, they're fabulous. They could send you for a screening calcium score. Those are done, they can even be done through capital cardiology or like uh, different places like Latham Imaging, different areas, you could even start the process there. And as long as like, say you have a score of zero, remember you wanna be a zero, Fine that way. If there's any concern, you could always speak to your oncologist team. Uh, I've done lots of talks with them of the patients that I would like to see that I think are at that extra risk that we spoke about in the beginning. And many times your oncologist can point you in the right direction and say, listen, I think you should go see Eusilia Stahura, whoever these people. But if you're in that low risk, no, they could screen from afar. Okay, that's great. Yes, I, I, I thought that may be appropriate for some individuals. But I'm going under the, you don't have symptoms under the, you don't know what you don't know. And so Mira, I'm gonna turn questions over to you. You had a couple that you wanted to, to put in and I see some other things are starting to come up. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you, you used uh, LS as, as the test patient uh, to discuss with us. And it looks like she had a really great uh, result from the medications. So. Mm -hmm. Once she, in my word, maybe not the right one, is stabilized, what, what's a reasonable, does she come every month to the clinic or every six months or, you know, what, what kind of, can a patient expect? Once so one, a great yeah. question. Once now, every doctor is a little bit different. Remember, I call myself a heart stalker. Okay. So part of what I would do if, if L with LS is she recovers, she's doing well on therapy, she's feeling well. At this point, this patient does not need any more treatment options. So that she is, she's in her survivorship part right now and not going to be exposed to anything that could be potentially toxic. I would probably check on her three months and then start spacing it out to every six months. And eventually at once a year after, as long as I can ensure that stability, this would change if someone needed more therapies, like say she needed an astrozole or tamoxifen or something that way, I would probably keep them on every three to six months until they're done with that. And also just doing education of what to look out for and when to come in sooner. As far as the echoes, I like to ensure probably two, I would do her echo showed her EF normalized. I would probably do one another six months to ensure that it's staying that way and then normally a year, and then I would start to space those echoes out after. So 
And then um, regarding the calcium score, once it's high, there's plaque in your in your heart. Does it ever go away? Great question. You remember we spoke with there's you can have a little bit of regression, which is lowering if you start a statin, but no. That's why I guess I like to do talks like this to know I want to catch it early. I want to catch it when you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, rather than doing it in your 70s when your score is high, because if we can implement some healthier stuff before, quit smoking, get exercising, lower your cholesterol, we can prohibit that score of 100 at the age of 50 from becoming 600 when you're, when you're older. And then call, carefully monitor to make sure with stress testing that there isn't something growing. But no, it does not go away, unfortunately. It's like a cavity. So sometimes people have what their primary or even the cardiologist might say it's an innocent heart murmur. You know, you hear these things, which maybe makes more sense to you. And they don't need medication when they go to the dentist using their cavity for example, um, and it's just stable and it just gets listened to on a regular basis or evaluated and de be determined it's not a problem, but then they get cancer and they have treatments. You know, I'm not asking specifically, can an innocent murmur turn into something more insidious, but should that patient be, are they now in a higher risk factor and should they be evaluated at least post-treatment knowing that there was some condition, albeit mild, Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think all murmurs in this day and age should be investigated with at least one echo. So there are murmurs that are the innocent ones that are really, I don't mean to say that they're no big deal, but they don't confer any risk to the person with that. And an echocardiogram lets us physically see, like I showed you guys, is the valve thick? Is it too leaky? Many times we can hear with the stethoscope and determine it, but the severity is really, really more appropriately assessed by an echocardiogram. And yes, so that's a question. If you have mild aortic stenosis, so mild thickening of the aortic valve, but then you need to undergo therapy where you might have radiation to this area. Yes, that does confer an increased risk that way. And those are the people that I think would be beneficial to be followed by a cardiologist, even if it's upfront with your therapy and then once a year after. So just a simple echo by either your primary or coming in to see us. And then we can assess the risk and go further. If it's trivial leakiness of your tricuspid valve, not a problem. And we can help to let you know, is it worrisome or is it not? Thank you. And um, I see somebody asked specifically about an autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's, as a risk factor. You mentioned RA, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Is that in the same category to throw someone potentially into a higher risk? Great, great question. Not as much with the heart function with Hashimoto's, but any thyroid disease technically increases a risk of heart arrhythmias, especially in females. So something you ladies might have heard of is called atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Um, thyroid diseases and atrial fibrillation are, are common. So with my patients with Hashimoto's, we talk about that. We get an EKG. We discuss if you have any palpitations, taking them seriously and putting you on many times a wearable heart monitor at home. If your thyroid is not, um, your levels are not intact, your TSH, your T4 and T3, it can cause high cholesterol. So yes, not in the sense of causing um, serious weakened heart muscle, and but it can cause thyroid, excuse me, uh, lipid issues as well as um, uh, atrial fibrillation or rhythm disorders of the heart. And then I see a question here, how soon prior to starting um, what might be cardiotoxic treatments should you go to have a, a sort of baseline testing done? If, if timing works, sometimes that's an issue. But. And actually we're pretty good. So um, I, I work very closely with the St. Peter's and the New York Oncology Hematology team. Um, they, they will message me. I get messages from my team. So gosh forbid, if you guys ever have somebody that needs help, we're pretty good at getting them in sooner. Truthfully, to answer that question, any time before. So normally, uh, let's say a woman comes to see me, she needs to start chemo the next week. 
I will make time to get her in uh, how important this is. We will get a screening echo done really within either that day or the, a couple days after to know that ejection fraction and strain imaging so that we have that baseline. And then we talk, do we need cardioprotective medications? Do we need something else in the meantime to start with that? But I would say uh, just has to be before um, it, it doesn't need to be one month or anything just prior to initiation is important to me. I see two questions relating to you in particular. Um, <laughs> where do you personally see patients at what offices? Because they do have several. Are there other um, cardio oncology? Absolutely. Yes, so in the area, and are you accepting new oh, oncology patients? Of course, of course, I'm here to help. Okay, so I am a busy bee. I work all over. We have offices in um, our flagship office is the uh, and where the typical cardio oncology clinic is. We do that in our Southwoods office over um, Seven Southwoods Boulevard in Albany. That's like our big office that has a lot of the testing, the calcium scores, all of that. But let's say you're a Troy lady and you really don't like crossing the bridge. I have an office in Troy. So even though it's not a cardio oncology day, I can still see my patients over there. We also have an office in Clifton Park where I see patients. Um, gosh forbid anyone needed help. I also round at all of the major hospitals. I work at Albany Med, St. Peter's and Samaritan Hospital. So truthfully, we're all over and whatever location works best for you, we, that's, that's where we can, we can help. And are you aware of any other local cardio oncology <laughs> professionals? Yes, thank you for that. Sorry, my partner, Jeffrey Uzilia, he's absolutely fabulous. He helped me spearhead this program. Um, love Jeff. He, he's fabulous, very knowledgeable, very kind. Uh, the two of us do most of it. Oh, and I should also put in what I think is really unique to our program. When you come in for a cardio oncology visit, not if I see you in those other, like say it's an urgent thing I have to see you in Clifton Park for, but you'll typically sit down with our pharmacists first. They run through all of your medications. We look at your chemos and, 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 and your um, hormone therapy. And it's great. You can interact. You can ask about supplements. You can ask about certain side effects because they're they're super smart pharmacists so i think that's a great thing we offer in our cardio oncology program thank you i'm looking to see i don't see any other questions in the q a and i'm looking in the chat and so far we've answered all the questions that are there um so maybe i'll just sort of recap one of the questions that we started before we officially started the the program today, we were just chatting, and um, one of my curiosities was seeing the interplay, and, and you did answer this through your slides, but seeing the interplay of kidney disease as, as people age, uh, lung-related, you know, maybe COPD, you know, lung issues, and then the cardio issues that you've discussed. Um, at what point should, should a patient say to their primary, I think maybe it's time for a referral to cardiology because we're watching my kidney score go lower by the year, for example, I'm making this up, or, and we're watching, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little, a little trouble here. It could be my lungs. It could be, you know, something else. At what point do they say, I think it's time if the, if the physician you know, hasn't already said, mm -hmm. maybe it's time. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd say if you're having, if we have exposed to any of those things that we talked about in your years and your survivorship, I think it's good to be screened. Um, at least once, 10 years after your cancer treatment, you've been, been a survivor. I, I think at least all people deserve a screening echocardiogram, EKG, and, a set, and like a full body exam and listening. Now, if you're suffering from obviously chest pains, chest pressure, reflux disease that won't go away, swelling of your legs that really doesn't improve when you put your feet up at the end of the day, um, uh, palpitations, heart flutters, excessive fatigue and sweating that you can't say, oh, this is due to my menopause or something. Those are those buzzwords, uh, de decreased exercise tolerance. I used to be able to run and play with my grandkids. No longer can I do that. I can't get through doing my groceries without really huffing and puffing. Those are the things I go through and I, 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 would, I would ask for patients to either seek help or again, 
come to our walk-in clinic. We, if you think there's something emergently, we actually have walk-in clinics in Clifton Park in Albany. So if you think it can't wait, or gosh forbid, it's two weeks until you're gonna see me or Jeff Uzilia, you go there and you get board certified cardiologist and we can run your testing like this. Great, thank you. Um, I'm looking and I'm not seeing, unless you are any other follow-up questions. Um, this was so informative. You know, I, I always learn a lot from these programs, which is why I'm a big fan of doing them on a very regular basis. Um, and for anybody who's, uh, Eileen always says, keeping score, our next, our next, we used to do a program that was all in one day in person. So we've, because of the pandemic, and, and this actually is a nice arrangement. We, we've broken it up into several different Zoom presentations. And our next one is Tuesday, January 10th at 9 a.m. And it's how to read your breast pathology report, which by the way, has changed over time. There's a lot more information, that's the good news. Uh, a lot more information that patients can see on that report and more patients are seeing their reports with the use of portals and just more interaction with the physician. So it's, it's sometimes helpful to have a better understanding of what some of these words mean and numbers mean. And that's with Dr. Sandra Shin. She's professor and chair of uh, the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Albany Medical Center. So that's our upcoming event. Um, I want to also thank the New York State Department of Health New York Oncology, Hematology, Fenimore Asset Management, Capital District Physicians Health Plan, and Women at Work, because they sponsored this and the other uh, health programs that we're doing. And um, in case you're not aware of all the other things that Two Life does, in addition to this, we're still running our support group network. Um, in addition to general support groups, we have a young survivor group, a meta thriver group, a general group that's also bilingual in Spanish and English. And we reached, recently launched our positively living group, which is really open to anyone dealing with a breast cancer diagnosis. And um, it leans a little bit towards those who are just finishing or have already completed active treatment. We have our boutique for mastectomy uh, related products, uh, mastectomy bras, et cetera, and our wigs, hats, and scarves, and also help people dealing with chronic hair loss due to alopecia or whatnot. Um, and uh, I'm going to call to your attention, you'll get an email that uh, will have a link for our survey for today's program. And we really appreciate your feedback and encourage, um, you know, we, we talk amongst ourselves and we have a, an education and scientific advisory board that I, that I still chair. Um, and, and we discuss what kinds of programs might be helpful in our community. And so if there's something that interests you, um, just, you know, make a note of that and um, <clears throat> we'll, we will absolutely discuss it. Uh, and we do repeat programs over time or not identical because things change, which is all good. So um, I just want to um, thank you so much, Dr. Stahura, and uh, you do great work and we're really lucky to have you in our region, championing women's health and our hearts. And I don't know about anybody else, but I feel really guilty unless I go to the gym today. So <laughs> only eat a salad for the rest of the day. Everything in moderation, please. I want everybody to enjoy. I just want to confer a little like fire to go get it done though too, okay? <laughs> so let's get out for a walk, but be careful of the ice and the snow who's ever on the call. And um, sometimes inside exercise makes good sense in, in the winter, but not to ignore cross country skiing and snowshoeing. There you go. They really get the heart pumping. Absolutely. But, but check with your cardiologist first as to what's appropriate exercise Absolutely. regimen for yourself. Did I get thank that? Thank so much. Good thank disclaimer. You. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So thank you again to everybody. There's. Let me just check the chat. Um, oh, the recording will be on our YouTube um, uh, channel. 
And when you get, uh, you'll get an email with that information once we've got it all established. So uh, Eileen or someone from the office will be sending that out. Probably, it might not be today, but soon. And then you'll be able to listen again. So thank you again. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you everyone who attended. Awesome. I hope next time it's in person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>